leveling up cha challenges and opportunities of infrastructure strategy and game. This seems interesting to me, so hopefully I don't lose you guys. Let's, uh, let's check it out. The gaming industry rarely stands still for long, and it is currently going through another phase of major change and innovation. A flurry of major studios acquisitions made by Microsoft, Sony, and Take-Two in recent months, for instance, is worth about over $80 billion combined, contributing to the view that the industry has entered a period of consolidation. At the same time, consumer expectations have risen to the point where 4K quality with 60 or even 120 frames per second are becoming must-haves for gamers who want to want the best experiences. Isn't that crazy, though? This is cloud gaming. That's insane. To me. Like now, Wi-Fi on a plane is like expected. Where, when if you're my age or Rays or <laughs> people in that tier of age. <laughs> I mean, we grew up with no cell phones. When I graduated high school, I borrowed my mom's cell phone. Just for effect, I'm going to show you guys which one. <laughs> so this is what I borrowed from my mom when I went to uh, Senior Ditch Day to Six Flags Magic Mountain. Developers also are continuing to push the boundaries of technical innovation and excellence with VR gaming becoming more compelling and AI taking a bigger role in game mechanics. I'm more excited about AI than about uh, VR. For some reason, AI seems like such a such a far dream to reach, you know what I mean? Uh, it's, it's scary at the same time, though. Like, iRobot, VR is a lot of fun depending on the game. So I was super excited about uh, VR, uh, yeah, VR lenses uh, back in the day where you can feel like you have a 100-inch TV in front of you. But then it just didn't work. It didn't, for me, it just made me dizzy. Cloud gaming is a service. The nature of the way consumers play games is also changing. Microsoft's cloud gaming solutions, for instance, enables people to stream their gaming experiences as a service rather than the traditional method of downloading large game files from the internet or disk in order to play. From Xbox, it was remembering. It started with cartridges and then it went to CDs, DVDs, Blu-rays, and then digital. And I think Switch is the only one that uses cartridges still. The growth of the subscription-based services clearly showed the uh, direction of travel within the industry and also increases the re reliance of publishers on high-performance, reliable infrastructure. Gaming market big and volatile. It's an industry supported by a huge eco ecosystem of content creators, live streamers, and professional gamers who are playing an important role and fueling a market expected to grow to over 300 million in value globally by 2027 bro that's five years away and and we're that's us they're talking about us right there even funding models have changed over the years with space game star citizen being the most dramatic example of crowdfunding success having raised over 440 million to date i don't know what they're talking about have changed oh funding like how they fund i thought they were talking about our girl <laughs> like a model like <laughs> I gotta work on my reading comprehension. The gaming market is also volatile and it's hard to predict with certainty which new game will be a success or which publisher will create a new gaming franchise that will deliver sustained interest over the long term. Whether it's success stories like Candy Crush or Fortnite, there's always something new out there to grab the attention of gamers. However, the average lifespan of the game is not fixed, and there have been huge controversies in the past few years as publishers released games before they were fully developed. The likes of Fallout 76, No Man's Sky, Cyberpunk 2077, speaking of, and Star Wars Battlefront 2 are among many notorious examples of the huge media and consumer backlash that can occur when games are released for sale too early. When Sony stopped selling Cyber 2077, that was... Yeah, that, that was a good sign. But see, now it's, it's survived. Now people play the game and it's great. You know what I mean? So, so perspective. Despite a variety of challenges, it's a hugely successful global industry while the Asia Pacific region still generates the most revenue, followed by the United States to deliver a AAA success story with massive player uptake. Publishers need to be in, position, in a position to go global in a fast, cost-effective way. Whatever's holding up Google Stadia, from expanding to all these countries. I think it is a part not being embarrassed by, you know, uh, by stretching itself thin and, you know, having major issues. But if Stadia is struggling right now with uh, a few countries, 
and you know people demanding more and more and more imagine if it would expand if it expanded uh, faster i mean then you start talking about you know millions of people complaining about a service that maybe wasn't ready and also how do you do that how do you expand without burning you know through the savings or cash results you know what i mean so it's kind of, kind of one of those things uh, winning with infrastructure. What all this innovation has in common is a thirst for computing power. For both users and gaming platforms alike, this constantly changing and volatile market brings a range of challenges for both developers and platforms. Gamers are demanding the demographic and expect a great deal in terms of speed and quality alongside a consistently great gameplay experience. I mean, if anybody knows that, it's the Stadia community, right? <laughs> This requires a tailored game platform with scalable game servers and high clock CPUs, GPUs, as well as global infrastructure for in-game traffic and, content, and a content delivered network for fast delivery. This is necessary in order to maximize service uptime, player retention, the potential for growth, and ultimately increase game revenues. That's that's the game right there. Like that's the game. Who can who can generate the most profit while at the same time spending or investing the least it's return on investment you know <clears throat> which sounds like a boring topic but if you think about it any game that that fails or movie that fails is somewhere along the line uh something you know something financially kind of happened like uh, you know uh, what was that movie that this movie they spent like 300 million it failed because they spent 300 million on it so if it would have made you know 200 million that would have normally been a success a, su a success but it didn't match the, the amount they spent so that's that's the thing that's what makes it uh you know fail or succeed you know how do you get to that end goal uh investing the least amount but providing the best uh the best service cdn so content delivery network for instance is scaled to take the strain of peak traffic today with room to grow for tomorrow they also help game platforms achieve cost effective secure delivery of patches and updates while providing the ease and speed of deployment in a new region without the need for major infrastructure investment in the new uh region itself it sounds like this is an article that uh project storm would enjoy right so maybe somebody should tweet that this to him. This is important because cost-effective expansion can be both risky and difficult, not least because predicting game popularity and traffic patterns in a new region can be challenging. As a result, game develop developers and platforms are increasingly turning to specialist infrastructure partners who can help them cost-effectively tap focus on growth while keeping investment low. I mean, I don't know if you guys think this article is boring, but I think it's saying a lot. What's more, game hosting is secure data centers will prevent this disruption to game servers and protect both businesses and cons cons Ooh, customer data. Redundant, scalable game servers, businesses can maintain the user gaming experience and prevent downtime, ultimately protecting both revenue and reputation. Oh, right there. That's what I just said. I mean, I basically took from there. I mean, IT leaders have a choice level their infrastructure or game over okay i mean i thought that was interesting anybody else or am i alone on that one am i a boring guy everybody's still here so maybe maybe it wasn't that bad 